Hello everyone, and welcome to the post-commentary of my Krakow into Poland-Lithuania speedrun. The objective of this speedrun category is, unsurprisingly, to form Poland-Lithuania starting as Krakow, but it does not require you to reclaim all of their cores, just forming the country is enough. To do so, you have to either own or sphere all Polish-Lithuanian cores, shown here, which includes territory owned by Austria, Prussia and Russia. So let's jump into it, shall we? On the surface, Krakow might seem like one of the weaker countries in the game, but they actually have two distinct advantages that make things a lot easier for them. The first is that they start in Austria's sphere of influence, which means you can always get an alliance with them and exploit them as your personal attack dog in early wars. I intend to make use of that by obtaining a make puppet CB on two Sicilies. But the second advantage is what truly makes Krakow stand out, the infinite infamy burning exploit. Here's how it works. In Victoria 2, you can get rid of a bit of infamy by releasing puppets from your own territory, specifically 5 infamy per puppet released. Normally, this can only be done once per puppet, and is thus fairly limited. When you release a puppet, they will gain every one of their core provinces that you own, with one possible exception. If they have a core on your capital province, you will still retain ownership of it. But what if you're playing a country that only has one province, such as Krakow, and there is release of a nation with a core on it, such as Poland. Well, as it turns out, Poland still shows up in the list of releasable nations, and if you click the button, the game will act as if you release them, including reducing your infamy by 5. But since the only Polish core you own is your capital, Poland ends up getting no promises at all. And since they have no promises, you still have the option to release them again. And again. And again. The result is that you have a never-ending source of infamy reduction at your disposal, as long as Poland doesn't get released from someone else or you obtain any other Polish core provinces. The only limitation is that you can only release puppets when you're at peace, so you have to take care not to exceed the infamy limit during a war. Anyway, using this trick, I could quickly get rid of the infamy I got justifying a make puppet war goal on two Sicilies. Speaking of which, perhaps it's time I explain why I went for this particular war goal against this particular target. The purpose of this first war is simply to increase my military power so that I won't have to rely on Austria to fight my wars for me later. Which is important, since Russia will typically remove you from Austria's sphere early on, at which point Austria will no longer be willing to help you in offensive wars. The reason I go for two Sicilies is simply because they're the most valuable target that Austria can reliably reach and beat, and the reason I make them a puppet is because then I get control of all of their free states at once and two Sicilies can also raise more armies from each of them than I could have done if I had conquered them directly. The war itself is really out of your control though, and all you can do is sit and watch and hope that Austria doesn't screw up too much. They will almost always win the war in the end, but sometimes they will spend a good amount of time just aimlessly flailing about while their stacks get picked off one by one by the more concentrated Sicilian forces, before they finally get their act together and finish the war. So the amount of time this takes is essentially random. When the war is finally over, I stand as the proud owner of an adorable little puppet that will soon grow up into a fearsome attack dog, and can thus take over that role from Austria. Since their armies get wiped by Austria during the war, they will need some time to build up, and in the meantime I start justifying a demand concession war goal on Egypt. I don't actually need anything in particular from Egypt, rather this war serves a different purpose, but I'll get to that in a bit. When the war goal is ready, I declare war to acquire the island of Crete, and as soon as I can I take command of two Sicily's armies. In case you didn't know, yes, this is a thing you can do with your puppets, which is very handy. I first make use of what few transports two Sicily's has to begin ferrying their troops over to Crete three at a time. Once Crete has been occupied, I then begin ferrying troops from Crete to mainland Egypt as quickly as I can. In this game I got lucky enough that the Ottomans had already destroyed a sizable part of Egypt's armies in another war but if they hadn't, it would have been easy for Egypt to overwhelm any initial landing force I sent just by their sheer numbers, while I'm restricted to sending three regiments at a time due to a lack of transports. So that's why it's important to use Crete as an intermediary rally point, so you can ship as many armies to the mainland as possible in as short a time as possible. Even then, this naval invasion is very risky, and you should make sure to send a defense general along with the first army to improve your odds. But thankfully in this case, Egypt's army was too battered to contest me at all. After moving the bulk of two Sicily's armies, I can soon make peace with Egypt. 
but for that I need to justify and declare a humility's war goal on the Indian OPM Sikkim, which I do just before ending the war with Egypt. And now I can explain what the purpose of these wars actually were. I need to make sure the Sicily's armies become exiled, so that they can move freely across the continent. Normally, the simplest way to get exiled is to ask another country for military access and then cancel it again as soon as their units have entered the land. But unfortunately, I cannot ask for or cancel military access on behalf of my puppets, so the only reliable way to get them exiled is to have them standing in enemy territory when the peace is signed. To that end, I needed to find a nearby target that I could fight a quick war against, and Egypt is probably the best option in this case. The reason I chose Crete as the war goal is simply because that's the cheapest one I could have gone for, to make the war as quick as possible. As for the war with Sikkim, its only purpose is to allow me to remain at war in between fighting Egypt and my next target, because while I'm at peace I will lose control over the Sicily's armies, and they are also likely to demobilize. But the Sikkim war ensures that neither of those things happen. Or well, technically, due to a bug I did lose control over the Sicily's armies when I signed the peace with Egypt despite being at war with Sikkim, and for whatever reason the game wouldn't let me take control of them again. Fortunately, this is easily fixed by simply reloading the game, allowing me to take control of their armies once more. Now, why did I want to get two Sicily's armies exiled in the first place? Well, if you watched some of the earlier Vic 2 speedruns, you can perhaps already guess. That's right, we're going to conquer Korea. It turns out that attacking Korea is a very efficient and reliable way to quickly grow your power and prestige as a minor nation, which will allow me to become a great power and also muster a sizable army of my own, enough to challenge even the major powers of Europe head on. But of course Krakow wouldn't be able to defeat Korea with just a single regiment they can recruit at the start, so that's why I had to first make two Sicilies into a puppet and get their armies to East Asia to take care of that for me. But before I start fighting Korea, I must admit I made a mistake in regards to Sikkim. Rather than declare war on them before making peace with Egypt, what I could have done is end the war with Egypt first, then declare war on Sikkim on the same day. If you don't unpause the game in between, you will still retain control of your puppet's armies and there's no risk they will demobilize. But that brief moment of peace would have allowed me to burn some more infamy before proceeding. After justifying a conquest war goal on Korea, my infamy is now over 20, and I'll need to spend even more infamy than that during the Korean War, so it's crucial that I get to lower it before that war begins. So to make up for that mistake, I instead had to make sure to end the war with Sikkim right before declaring on Korea which meant I had to send a decent stack to occupy Sikkim, leaving me with less troops to deal with Korea. But what can you do? I make sure to time things so that my army is set to arrive inside Korea exactly one day after declaring war. My first objective here is to wipe Korea's army, then occupy their provinces until they're willing to accept their annexation. But so far there's one little detail I've neglected to mention, namely the fact that Korea is an ally of China and that China actually joined this war in their defense. This might seem like a major problem, but thankfully, due to some odd quirks with the AI, China will in fact never send any armies to Korea before you annex them, as long as you keep your armies out of the territory of China itself or one of its sub-states. I'm not entirely sure why this works, but I suspect it has something to do with the fact that Korea doesn't border China directly, only its sub-state Manchuria, and Manchuria itself isn't part of this war, so that messes with the AI somehow but that's just speculation on my part. Either way, this means I can comfortably occupy Korea without China getting involved. In the meantime though, I have to keep an eye on to Sicily's homeland, because they are prone to getting hit by Garibaldi redshirt rebels, which I'll have to deal with in that case. If the rebels occupy provinces, it will reduce Sicily's ability to reinforce their armies, which is a problem, but the most important thing is to make sure their capital Naples doesn't get occupied for more than a year since then the event Expedition of the Thousand will trigger and let Sardinia Piedmont form Italy, most likely integrating two Sicilies in the process. For obvious reasons, this is something I want to avoid. When most of Korea has been occupied, they're willing to accept their annexation in a separate peace deal, but as China is the war leader, they will stay in the war and automatically, as war goals, liberate Korea from me again. And now that Korea has been annexed, it finally snaps the Chinese AI out of their days and they will now begin to send armies from Manchuria to fight me. But the armies of two Sicilies won't have to stand alone, as I can now begin recruiting Korean regiments to fight against their former allies. Conquering Korea actually gives you a ton of soldier pops, 
which is one of the reasons they're such a good target for a smaller country looking for a power boost. Once you have a decently sized army in position, fighting China actually isn't too hard. You just stay in Korea and let them send individual stacks that you can then pick off one by one. Thanks to the tech difference, the fact that you have artillery and they don't, and that China tends to be very bad at assigning generals to their armies, you can generally melt them like butter. Eventually, you reach the war score cap from battles, plus 50. But if you wait even longer, China will begin to get negative tickers from their automatic Liberate Korea war goals that they can't fulfill, so you can get a decisive victory without ever having to set foot in China itself. In my case, I make use of that to add two war goals to seize territory from China's substase, Guangxi. Guangxi has more or less the same population density as China proper, but will have more soldier pops to provide since they're not directly involved in the war, and thus won't have their armies constantly annihilated, unlike China. Besides getting these territories, the battles themselves also have their benefits, as they're an excellent source of prestige. This battle prestige, combined with the prestige and military power gained from the annexed territories, will be more than enough to make me a great power shortly after the war is done. Being a great power isn't strictly required to form Poland-Lithuania, but it does give me the option to sphere some of the required territory rather than having to own everything directly, which all in all is easier to accomplish. When I'm happy with the amount of prestige I farm from battles, I make peace with China. Before that though, I make sure to move my armies into Manchuria so that they get exiled and I can move them back to Europe. I once again made a mistake here though, as I had originally planned on declaring another war similar to the one I did against Sikkim earlier, in order to retain control over Sicily's armies on the way back. But I forgot to justify any war goals, so Sicilies instead marched their armies straight to their homeland. The problem with that is that most of the troops I built in Korea were artillery, as I counted on two Sicilies infantry to hold the front line. But now that they march back to southern Italy, there's a good chance they'll be stuck there. I'm able to build more troops in my new Chinese territories, but it's going to take a while before I can get them back to Europe, so in the meantime I might be left with a very imbalanced army composition. Either way though, I have no time to waste, so I immediately start justifying war goals on Austria and their tiny ally Parma. I want to fight Austria, but I don't want all of their allies to get dragged in too, so by declaring on Parma, I only have to fight them and Austria. When I became a great power, I also started influencing the Ottomans, who had dropped the secondary power, in the hopes of being able to sphere and ally them. Once my war goals were finished and my Korean troops had arrived in Europe, I started the war against Austria. I was lucky enough that the Sicilies had gotten military access through Papal States, so I could actually move them into and through Austria to reinforce my artillery-heavy units with some infantry. I also managed to ally the Ottomans in time for the war, which turned out to be quite helpful as they distracted most of Austria's troops while I occupied my war goals, specifically the Polish course. The Ottoman ports in the Persian Gulf also proved very helpful, since I could drop off my new armies from China there, rather than having to sail all the way around Africa, which most likely would have been a suicide mission. Once I got my armies in order, the war didn't end up being too difficult, and I could eventually peace out by liberating Poland from Austria. This instantly places them in my sphere, which is nice since I need all of their territory to form Poland-Lithuania later. Here we also see another interesting side effect of the infamy burning exploit. Normally when you liberate a country like this through war, it will become your spherling but will otherwise be independent. But in this case Poland actually became my puppet. The reason for that is that when I fake released them to burn infamy earlier, the game assigned them as my puppet even though they didn't have any territory. And now that they finally got some territory, their puppet status still remained. The more you know. The next step of the run is to go after Prussia, or more accurately, the North German Federation. However, I ran into some more problems here. There are three states I need from the NGF, and my original plan was to grab one of them for myself by releasing two one-state miners from the others, thus placing them in my sphere. However, I hadn't planned out my infamy well enough so at this point I wouldn't be able to add all those war goals without exceeding the infamy limit. And since I released Poland from Austria, I can no longer make use of the infamous infamy burning exploit. In the end, I decided to change my plans a bit. I fought two wars in total against the NGF. In the first one I made them release Danzig from Westpreußen. When you force to release another country for war, they always gain ownership of the entire state where they have cores, 
even if they only have a single core there, such as Danzig. This war turned out to be quite a bit tougher than the one against Austria. I tried to play cautiously and stay in my own territory while fighting off invading armies with local numerical superiority before they had a chance to amass, which worked out rather well for the most part, but I did get caught in some rather too big battles a few times which forced me to retreat. On top of that, the UK decided to get involved midway through the war, but fortunately they didn't do much more than set up a few naval blockades. Eventually though, I managed to thin out the German numbers enough to advance forward and occupy parts of their country, until they eventually agreed to peace. Because of my unfortunate infamous situation, I then concluded that the best way forward would be to research nationalism and imperialism, since that gives me access to War of Unification, basically a bunch of free war goals to conquer all the core territory of your cultural union, which in this case is Poland-Lithuania. The reason I had an aim for this straight away is because I wanted to prioritize military techs, and because I hoped to have enough infamy to spare to not require this technology, but due to how things turned out I had to resort to this as a backup plan. It took me a few years to finish researching the technologies I needed, then I justify a war goal on NGF's ally Baden, in order to circumvent the truce I had with NGF. In this second war I went a bit more aggressive from the start, since my enemies hadn't fully recovered from the last war. I added my War of Unification war goals for Posen and Ostpreußen during the war and could eventually peace out for them. Now all that remained was to take on Russia. I already had a War of Unification sea beyond them, but I still opted to attack their Sphereling Serbia to avoid getting Russia's ally France involved. Seeing as I have CBs to take every Polish-Lithuanian state I need, you might expect that I would be doing just that in this war. But the issue is that Russia has so many Polish-Lithuanian cores that they would exceed 100% war score, which means I wouldn't be able to take them all in a single war. So instead, the objective of this war is something different. Force Russia out of great power status and then sphere them. Since having the required territory in my sphere of influence is sufficient for following Poland-Lithuania, this method works just fine and is actually easier than outright conquering everything since enforcing an add to sphere war goal only costs 50 war score. But of course, I first need to beat Russia down below rank 8. To this end, my main focus of the war is to destroy as many of their armies as possible, which will reduce both their military score and their prestige. But I also need to occupy a lot of territory to get the required war score by the end of the war. All in all, this is a rather tedious process, due to the sheer size of Austria and its army but isn't too hard, since they're lagging far behind me in military tech. How quickly you can drop Russia from GP partially depends on how well other countries are doing, and in my run I got a bit unlucky as the great power contender Spain had trouble keeping up with Russia despite my efforts. But eventually I managed to push Russia down to secondary power and could add the sphere war goal. By then I had more than enough war score and could make peace immediately. With Russia in my sphere and all the other required territory, either owned or sphered, I could finally form Poland-Lithuania on the 10th of August 1859, 23 years, 7 months and 9 days after the start date. I'm content with this time for now, but it could certainly be done a lot earlier than this. Early 1850s could be done with just a bit more planning, and even pre-1850 should be possible if you put your mind to it. I'm pretty sure this nonetheless is the fastest anyone has ever done this starting as Krakow, so I'll take it. Well, that's all for me. Thank you for watching and have a nice time of day.